uh, for those of you that um, uh, might be new to this meeting, this is our annual business meeting, um, as well as a chance to uh, uh, have guest speakers come. And so we're going to have a little bit of business here at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Zach has guaranteed that it will not go over 20 minutes, haven't you, Zach? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who know me, that's a big task. <laughs> So, um, since this is an official board meeting, um, I'm uh, uh, calling the uh, meeting to order. And what we typically do is um, review the minutes uh, from the last annual meetings act, is it? Which yep. I was not at. And are there copies of that for them? Yeah, in the uh, end up here, the quick one page thing basically just says. Uh, I opened up the meeting and uh, welcomed the many Ha Ha players uh, from the Living History Society of Minnesota uh, to give their, their play. Uh, I gave a report. Tom gave a report. Um, we thank the Ristis for their service on the board and voted in two new members, uh, Paul Brindle and Meg Judge. And then we uh, ended the meeting and had some refreshments. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants time to read over them more, or if we're good to uh, look for a motion to approve the minutes. And if, if you're a member of the Historical Society, you can make a motion, amend uh, a motion, and vote. Is that correct, Zach? Yeah. So, we'll entertain motions to accept the minutes as read by Zach. So moved. And, oh, by the way, um, uh, Donna could not be here. Um, we need to appoint someone to take notes. Can you please? I hate to do that to you. Okay. Here. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, Let's make all the motions. So, do you know? Do you know how to spell the name of the guy that made the motion? I do. <laughs> yeah. That's why I made it. <laughs> okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dick. Dick seconds. Um, any discussion, or we'll move to a vote. There being no discussion, um, uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as read, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes carried. Okay. Are we flipping the president's report with yours or not? Okay. Um, Steve Babolo, um, local resident, been president of Historical Society for a couple of years right now. And um, the challenge in me going first is not to take up all the 20 minutes because um, we've been doing a lot of things and we've really grown. Um, Three years ago, three and a half years ago, some of the board members suffered through two or three three-hour strategic planning meetings where we just pretty much turned the program inside out. And we came up with a list of things that we'd like to accomplish. And it seemed daunting at the time three years ago. This is the list. You don't have it. Um, but the things in orange are things that we have accomplished. Yeah, it makes it wow. <laughs> and it is wow. And that didn't even have the murals on it, um, or the history of it, uh, which have been uh, very successful. So uh, we've accomplished a lot. Um, I'm just looking at this. Do you want me to deal with the murals in this section? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, Zach's going to go over uh, some of the stuff we've done this year, but because I was so involved in the murals, um, uh, Zach wanted me to talk about them a little bit. Um, they're done, but they're not done because we keep getting suggestions and ideas and stuff. Um, one of the ideas is someone came up to me and said we should put a restoration prairie garden in front of the harvest mural instead of just some uh, standard um, commercial day lilies and stuff like that. And we're researching that a little bit. Somebody also said we should uh, um, acquire um, some of the old stone mill stones that still exist in Cannon Falls. Um, I enjoy telling people that the stone mill is still in town. And they go, where? And I say, the first baseline on John Birch Park. Park. <laughs> now, um, we're not planning to acquire them in the dark of night. <laughs> But they thought it might be fun to sprinkle some of them in front of the mural or maybe go to a little stub wall out or stuff like that. So 
uh, that type of stuff is going on. The city is looking at um, finding some stuff so we can light them, and um, hopefully the lighting will extend the viewing time and stuff like that. Um, there are going to be no murals in 2014. Um, it um, was a daunting task to get these done. We might be looking at murals in 2015. Um, I don't know if I got anything else on the murals except um, there are some very generous people that donated money. Tanner Falls Rotary Club gave us quite a bit of money to make this work. Uh, uh, Jim Burkhart uh, uh, gave us a lot of money. John Eltoff gave us money. Cannon Auto Repair gave us money. The American Dairy Association gave us money. Al and Ginny Johnson gave us some money. And Paul Bringle gave us some money. So for those businesses, we uh, encourage you to patronize them. But none of it would have been a, uh, accomplished without the uh, near $10,000 grant from Southeast Minnesota Arts Council. And uh, we need to uh, thank them for that. So. Uh, I'm just going to do the mural thing and then close with the vision thing, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Sure, Zach. So uh, now we can hand over to Tom for a quick treasurer's report. <laughs> for the treasurer's report, I don't know if everybody got one or not who would like to sheet. Um, basically, our fiscal year ends September 30th, so we start a new one October 1st. The, the, for, so for the previous year, uh, we started the year on October 1st of 2012 with $22,746 in the banks and um, ended, ended the year at $19,118. So we basically spent about 3,500 more than we brought in this year. Um, we actually, with the mural project and all that, we actually received more donations than we normally do, but we also spent more on the murals. Um, so we have some good numbers, but it's based on the mural project, which is pretty much a, a, a even wash. Um, we brought in just about as much as was spent on the murals. So the, the History uh, Society really didn't have that burden on them. Um, we just had Steve and others doing lots of legwork for it. Uh, between the salaries of Zach and Ryan, the only two paid employees we have, and then um, phone, internet, building, um, uh, or sorry, office supplies, those type of things, we spent $24,000 this year of which you can see 11,000 of that was on the mural. So if you take the mural project out, we're pretty much where we always are every year about this time. Um, of course, we can always, you know, we'd always like more money too, so you know, remember to pay your dues and all that. Um, I really have nothing more to add to it, um, just the fact that we're starting this year with $19,118.09. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. And since this is a, an official annual meeting, we do need a motion on this. So. Yep. If there are no questions, we can move <laughs> to accepting motions to accept the treasurer's report as um, delivered. I so move. Is there a second? A second. There being a second, is there any discussion? Second. Zach. There being no discuss discussion, uh, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? First report is accepted as uh, presented. <coughs> All right, great. <coughs> um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Excited to be here, excited to listen to the presentation tonight of uh, Gordon Fredrickson and Nancy Fredrickson. I had promised them that they could go on at uh, about, well, in about five minutes. So we're going to hurry this along. I had printed out a copy of my report for everybody to read. Um, we had a really fun and busy year at the museum. Attendance-wise, uh, we didn't 
know much, but we had about 800 people visit the museum this year. You say that's up maybe 50 visitors from the year before. We had our two annual open houses that had increased attendance, uh, the Deck of Falls and the Fourth of July. And we were out in the community a lot, um, handing out lemonade on the bike trail or in front of the, the museum, uh, speaking at the elementary school or Rotary or Chamber of Commerce. And we really did have a fun year. And on top of all of that, we got the exciting grant from the Arts and, and Arts and Cultural Heritage Grant to help further our mission and, and bring history alive in the community through the use of uh, art. And we kind of invited the Fredericksons here to speak tonight in that same vein because uh, they use art, illustration, and literature to share agricultural history. Um, the other things that I wanted to mention tonight just quickly were that uh, we continue to collect and some of our new acquisitions at the museum are really pretty special. We got uh, a journal from Doc Williams on all the, all the kids that he delivered in the 40 some years that he worked here as a family doctor. We got uh, a uniform from one of the old uh, quartets in town, uh, Melodons. We got uh, a neat old aerial photo from a Highway 52 study from 1936 that kind of pencils in Highway 52 years before they uh, put the road in. So, historically speaking, we got some, some neat things. Welcome, guys. And, hi, Lily. And then, uh, as far as committees that have been going this last year, we're, we have a remodeling committee that we're still working on. We've raised $1,500 to start a project. We uh, have some, some renovation plans drawn up, and we've met with the Minnesota Historical Society on grant ideas and how we want to move forward. So we can expect to do some, hear some more news on remodeling in the next year. And then uh, inventory committee, which uh, in the last year we we got some software to help us inventorize our collection digitally, so we can move forward with a robust uh, website and online presence. So we just have a little bit of uh, pressing business to get to before we turn the show over. And basically, um, every year the historical society has. Two new members or returning members that need to be um, voted on and, and come on. So, at this annual meeting, uh, terms for two of our board members have expired. Uh, Mr. Gavilo and Mr. Monroe, and they both agreed uh, to serve again if we have anybody that would nominate them. I would do that, Zach. Right. <laughs> So uh, we have uh, Tom and Steve nominated. Could we uh, have a, a vote? Anybody else want sure. to nominate anybody else? Anyone else want to be nominated or have uh, anyone to share? Okay. All right. So uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And Apollo, same sign. Okay, thanks, Steve and Tom. We got them back on for uh, three-year terms. And <laughs> so now I'd just like to uh, introduce Gordon Fredrickson. Come on up and share from uh, one of his newest books, uh, Farm Country Picnic. Really excited that he shares agricultural history with young people through stories and illustrations. So. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. And the show will begin right now. My name is Gordon Fredrickson, and I'm here to tell you real life adventures about farm life. For the past 14 years, I've been writing and performing stories of a fictional farm family in 1950. Now, I don't write these stories to try to glorify the good old days. No, that's not why I write at all. And I don't write the stories to lament the loss of many family farms. 
although maybe I do, but that's not why I write. Instead, I write these stories to try to preserve our farm heritage in an entertaining but accurate way. You see, all my stories are based on things farmers really do. Not made up stuff, but things that farmers really do. Sure, they're fiction, but that's just because I put events together to make the story interesting. They're all based on things farmers really do, and actually, I have two series of books. This is for the younger children. It's about a child and his or her pet imagining what they do on if they were a farmer, and they tell their pet all about it. A very cute concept, yes, but it's also accurate, because what they tell their pet, again, is what farmers really do. The story is their imagination. The other series, called The Farm Country Tales, is about the same farm family, three children, and their parents on a small family farm in the year 1950. Now my goal is to write 20 of these stories, 20 of them, that go from January through December of the year 1950 and show all those activities on the farm from winter through all the four seasons. And that I'm writing because I want people to pick up my books in a hundred years or more and say, so this is what it was like to be a child on a farm in 1950. As I said, I like my books to be entertaining and accurate. Those are two goals I have. I have 20 titles planned. I've had five of them done so far, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later. As I said, all my stories are based on actual events that happened to me on the farm I grew up on. And this is a photograph of that farm, 120 acres of hilly, rocky land in eastern Scott County, Minnesota, about a 40-minute drive from here. Not a very good farm. Only 65 acres tillable, certainly not the kind of farm you'd pass on from generation to generation. In fact, it's the kind of farm that when I told my dad when I was 10 years old, I said, Dad, I said, I think I'd like to farm when I grow up. And he said, tell you what, kid, I'll do you a favor and I won't give you this one. The idea was get a better farm if you're serious about it. Now, as I said, it wasn't a very good farm, but when my folks got a hold of it in 1940, picture this. There was no barn, no silo, no chicken coop, no well, and the house was pretty much a shack. This is what the house looked like when my folks moved in with their two little children in around 1940. Yeah, you see windows broken, that's their old car there. You might wonder, why did they move into a dump like that? Well, think about it, 1940, they grew up during the Depression. You've heard about it, read about it, you know about it, okay, the Depression. They were teenagers then. They didn't have a lot of hopes and dreams about the future, so they found themselves very lucky to be able to find a farm like this. Because if it had been a good farm, they couldn't have afforded it. Dad said he had 50 cents in his pocket when he got married. Ma always said he was exaggerating. He didn't have that money. So I don't know, but when they found each other and found this farm, they felt they were very lucky because they knew they could pursue their American dream. And their American dream was farming. So they pursued their American dream and they knew that with this poor farm, they weren't going to be able to crop farm. They were going to have to have a big herd of dairy cattle. So they knew they were going to have to build a barn. So one of the first things they did after they dragged in an old building to use for a chicken coop, chickens on one end and geese on the other, you know, you had to make a little pocket money after they did that, they started building that barn. And they hauled rocks from the field for the foundation, a lot of rocks all over, so they found a material to build a foundation. And they put in 33 stanchions and room for the horses. And they were able to get a hold of some cows. They borrowed some money to buy some cows, and they had some that they rented as well. But they didn't have enough money to put up a roof on the barn. So if you can imagine, my mother, no electricity of course, she milked 33 cows by hand, morning and night, without a roof on the barn, for a whole year, or a little better. Winter, summer, rain, snow, imagine that. Now, I don't tell you that story to make anybody feel sorry for my mother. My mother was a typical farm woman who could pretty much handle whatever you threw at her. I tell that story instead to remind us all of the sacrifices people go through whether it's in a business in town or on the farm, 
the sacrifices necessary to try to make a go of it, as they used to say back then. To try to make a go of it. And I, when I speak to elementary schools and senior highs, I always tell them, you know, if you want to pursue your American dream, you're going to have to get it in your head. You're going to have to sacrifice something. Even if you have some money behind you, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to study. You're going to have to work and so on. And that's why I like to tell that little story about my mother. And you know, I can remember when I first heard that story. And to this day now, whenever I start feeling just a little sorry for myself, I think about my mom milking cows morning and night in a barn without a roof on it. You might be wondering where my father was at this time when she was milking cows alone. Well, he walked uh, about three quarters of a mile across the pasture to a neighbor to milk cows there to earn some cash, to put a roof on the barn. And eventually they did. A couple of years later, they built a big silo, the biggest one in the area. Most of them were only 30 feet in 1943, I think they built it. This one was uh, 50 by 14. So it was a big silo, and it was always a struggle to get that full every year. And that is the subject of my next book, A Farm Country Silo Filling. By the way, we are looking for photos for that. Do anybody have any photos about silo filling with bundles? Be sure to talk to my wife. We'd like to get a copy. Now, <clears throat> I tell you these stories because, uh, you know, eventually my folks, as I said, built the barn, built the silo, and eventually they fixed up the house. And you see the house now, this picture is 1958. Uh, yeah, 1958, from 1940 to 1958. We all remember that that uh, fixing up a house is not a priority on the farm. Investing in the farm is the priority. So it took 18 years before they got running hot and cold, hot and cold running water in the house. 18 years. Now they had it in the milk house in the 40s. You had to have hot and cold running water in the milk house because you had to have grade A milk to do a good job making a living on the farm. So we all wanted to live in the milk house, you know, and that was really nice and modern. But of course you couldn't. It was against the rules. You had to live in the house. But it turned out to be a nice little place. I wanted to show you. Never a great farm, but a nice place to raise a family. And I always felt myself lucky to have grown up there. But the reason I tell you this story is because when my folks passed away, I thought about how representative their lives were of all the people I knew, and you knew as well, who started with nothing and made something out of it. They didn't get rich and famous or anything, but they made a good life for their family, and they enjoyed life, and they fulfilled their American dream to the extent that they lived it. And I thought about what could I write that would show that, because I know that museums have a hard time telling the story of the small farm because those buildings those farmers worked with are not preserved very easily. It's the buildings of the big farms that are preserved. So what you get is a living history farm that the county or the state buys, and maybe it was owned by some guy who made his money elsewhere and started it and hired managers, and then they have all those nice buildings and they bring visitors in and, oh yeah, they bring all these other buildings in and they bring all these tools run by belts and pulleys and things and people go visit that and they say, well, this is how it was on a farm. Wow, these farmers had everything. Not the farm I remember or that you probably remember either. And that's why I feel it's so important to tell the story of the small farm. Now, I thought about what I could write that would tell this story. And I thought about writing a big novel, and I thought, well, you know, that gets read and set aside, unless you can get somebody to make a movie out of it. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know what I want to write. But it came to me what I wanted to write. <clears throat> On the Friday after Thanksgiving in the year 1999, my parents had passed away. And my wife, this is a Friday after Thanksgiving, so my wife stayed home from work, she took a day's vacation to decorate for Christmas, which is what she always did on the Friday after Thanksgiving. So I came home and the house was all decorated, looked very nice, but what I noticed were these two books on the table that she always drags out. Yeah, the night before Christmas, you're all familiar with this. This is actually the original title, was A Visit of St. Nicholas, for those of you who didn't know that. 
this is a very old book here. And I looked at these books and I thought, aha, <clears throat> these books have been around almost 200 years. 1822, Clement Seymour wrote them. He wrote them for his children, but shortly after he wrote them, adults asked him to read them at Christmas parties. And I thought, aha, children's books that adults enjoy. I kind of like that idea. And the other thing I like is that people, these are entertaining and short, and people pick them up again and again. People are still buying these books after 200 years, and I thought, I kind of like that idea, too. Now, I had in my mind a Christmas story that I wanted to write. Now, when I was a child, my folks told me that Santa Claus did not come in the middle of the night for farm kids. You know, he came during chore time on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so, you see, I thought of the time when I was about 10 years old and some kids at school had told me they didn't believe in Santa Claus. And I was pretty disappointed because I wanted to believe in Santa Claus and I did believe in Santa Claus, but these kids told me they didn't. So I thought, well, I really want this sled. I know my folks can't afford this sled. I'm going to ask Santa for this sled, and if I get that sled, I will always believe in Santa Claus. Well, the story is, I got the sled, and that's the story I wanted to write. When I waited for Santa during chore time on Christmas Eve. But I thought, in my stories, I want to show farm activities the way they really work. So I'm thinking about what kinds of things do we go through that you wouldn't find in the history book, but you put in my book. Now, I'll show you the first thing I thought of. Watch the screen. <laughs> Everybody who's ever been on a dairy farm has done that. It's not something you're going to find in the history book. And yet, this is so much part of our heritage, is it not? And you know how this begins, don't you? You get a farmer sits down to milk a cow and a cat walks by and you know cats are kind of smart and cocky and you squirt them and the ears a little bit irritate them. But the cat's so fast he turns around and starts catching that milk. First thing you know, you get another cat wanting to do the same thing. Now, what do you call a cat who wants to do the same thing as another cat? That's your, a copycat, that's right. So the word copycat invented right here on the farm. That's right, how many people knew that, huh? A copycat. Now this is something I wanted to show in my book. And in the book, Farm Country Christmas Eve, you will see that very same thing where the mother in the story is milking the cow and uh, squirting the cats and she has the copycat there. Now, I'm thinking, what else, what else do I want to put in that book? I put a number of things, but those of you who were on a dairy farm, you knew that cows love to calf on holidays. So I thought, yeah, they go down to the barn, there's a newborn calf. There you see it, it uh, nursing on its mother there. And I thought, ah, what do you have to do when you get a newborn calf back in those days? You have to teach it how to drink out of a pail, don't you? Now there's something that's part of our heritage that you're not going to find in the history books. So. In my book, A Farm Country Christmas Eve, and in another one too, Nancy's Adventure, you actually have a child teaching a newborn calf how to drink out of a pail, and it explains how you do it. And I'm going to demonstrate here. I know many of you have done this, so if I see a smile on your face, I know you've done it before. Here's what you do. You take half a, half a pail of milk. We'll pretend this is half a pail of milk. We also have to pretend there's a calf here, because I didn't bring one. Okay? Now, you take your two fingers, can you hold up your two fingers? Yeah, hold up your two fingers, and you take them, and you dunk them in the milk. And you get them all wet and sticky. You feel how wet and sticky those fingers would get? And then you put them in the calf's mouth. Now, the calf is going to really like the taste of that milk, isn't he? And he's going to suck on those fingers so hard that you can kind of pull his head right down into that pail. And when his mouth gets close to the top of that milk, you can lift the pail till his mouth is on the milk. He's in the milk and he's still sucking on your fingers. <laughs> he's actually drinking. Now if you can just sneak your fingers out of there. And if he's still drinking, you have successfully taught a newborn calf how to drink out of a pail. Now that's the kind of thing I like to put in my books. Regular, everyday things that you're not going to see in the history books. One more thing I'm going to mention. Now realize I'm thinking about these things as I'm looking at the, at the covers of the uh, 
uh, a Christmas Story by Clement C. Moore. And I thought of this. I thought about all the cats we used to have in our barn. When I was a child in our barn, we always had 25 to 30 cats, if you can imagine. Now, these weren't house cats. These were barn cats. You remember all the barn cats, ladies and gentlemen? You'd walk in the barn, and they'd all come running at you, think you'd have something for them. You didn't pick them all up. Some would scratch. You'd tame some of them. But they were kind of wild and, and uh, full of a lot of spunk. And when you call your kitty kitty, you better get out of the way or have something for it. Here's what happened in the story when little Joey calls here kitty. Here kitty, come kitty, Joe called with great glee. And cats came from every place you could see. Cats came from the manger, from bales on a stack. And they came from the top of a cow's hairy back. And they came from the pens and above the barn wall and from the top of the stanchion. They answered Joe's call. Now, of course, you know, this is a stanchion made out of wood and steel. And right above it was that thick plank that would hold the stanchion in place. And on that plank is where all the cats would sit. They'd line up there, 20 of them in a row. And when you called, they'd jump down on the cat's back and onto the floor. And another image I like to share with you is remember coming down the barn early in the morning on a winter, cold winter morning, and the cows were still lying down. They're about this high when they're lying down. And curled up on top of some of them would be some kitties. They like sleeping on top of that cow's back. So I'm thinking about all these things. As I'm looking at these two books back in 1999 and the Friday after Thanksgiving, and I'm thinking about my story, so I write my story, I get it illustrated, and I send it off to East and West Coast publishers, all excited about getting my farm story published. And I wait, and I wait, and of course, you know what happens, right? Yeah, they're not interested in my farm story, are they? No, but they're not interested in my farm story. In fact, there's kind of an attitude in the East and West Coast, uh, reflected by the new word in the dictionary called flyover states. Yeah, they kind of think we're just flyover states, you know, you just kind of fly over us, there's not any use stopping, particularly I mean, you have to understand, these East and West Coast publishers, they need to make money on books they publish. And there's some people out there that don't understand how exciting and interesting farming is. Would you believe that? <laughs> now, regular people on the East and West Coast do buy my books. I get orders from Manhattan all the way over to San Francisco. But I'm talking about the publishing companies now. You know. As I said, a lot of people don't see how exciting and interesting farming is. I'll tell you a little story here. When I was uh, when I started dating, uh, my father gave me some good advice. He said, "Son, he said if you're ever going out with a girl and and you know you you kind of like her, but you just as soon break it off, but you don't want to hurt her feelings." He says, "All you have to do is talk farming all the time." <laughs> And sooner or later, she'll be gone. But, but then he gave me some even better advice. He says, you know, if that girl sticks around, you may want to hang on to her. <laughs> True story. Now, I went ahead and wrote that book. And my wife and I were so sure that it was a good story that we went ahead and we brought $2,000 and bought our own printer. We printed it at home, we assembled it at home, and I went out to schools, elementary schools, and, and uh, libraries and nursing homes, and I performed that book again and again. I performed it at threshing shows in hot tents three times a day, and this is what the book looked like right here. Very crude, and you know, I was so gratified that people liked my story. So I went ahead and I wrote a total of 10 of them. Yes, I wrote the If I Were a Farmer series back then, and I had a Christmas story, a Halloween story, a first day of school story, which tells the story of my first day of school in country school where the teacher actually picked me right up on my big overalls and threw me out the door. <laughs> Thanksgiving story, a picnic story, a ball game story, and a harvest story. Now, my wife and I were pretty excited about traveling through Minnesota and doing my stories. 
But I came to realize that if I was really serious, if I were really serious, ladies and gentlemen, about getting my books picked up in a hundred years, and you know I am serious about that, spreading our farm heritage and preserving it, I need a book that is more of a finished copy with a spine that can be put on library shelves, with a barcode that can be sold in gift shops. So I went ahead and I started calling around Minnesota to try and get a publisher. A lot had changed from the year 2000 to the year 2007. There were a lot of, a lot of uh, publishing companies that sprouted up. But I gotta tell you something, they still weren't too interested in farm stories, would you believe? Now, we know that farming is still the backbone of Minnesota, but you wouldn't tell it by looking at our quarter, would you? My point here is this. Minnesota does not really brag a lot about their, uh, their farm background. It's still kind of something that is there, but, you know, it doesn't have the prideful place it deserves. But I got a hold of one guy, his name was Milt Adams, in Beaver's Pond Press. Milt was 70 years old when he started his own business in 1997. He opened his own publishing company called Beaver's Pond Press. And the reason he was interested in me is he read this book, and he called me up and he said, the book should be published, and I'll tell you why. Here's Milt's brief story. You're going to like this. Milt was about three years old, I think, when both his parents were killed in a tragic car accident. So he was orphaned. And he was passed on from cousin to cousin to aunt to uncle all his childhood. And he said his best year was when he was 15 years old in 1942, when he was spending the year at his cousin's farm in Edgerton, Minnesota, 1942. He was 15. He said he learned how to milk cows by hand. He said he learned how to farrow hogs. He learned how to do field work with horses. He said he worked so hard and he learned a work ethic that stuck with him all his life. And he said if it meant that much to him to grow up on a farm, just one year, how about all the people who've dedicated their whole lives to farming? He said the book should be published and farm heritage should be preserved. And that uh, is Milt Adams, who, who is the first one who took that aggressive interest. So he worked with me on illustrators, and he worked with me on editors, and we came up with a farm country Christmas Eve. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you know I am dedicated to redoing all of these books, and I almost have all of them redone, but I'm also dedicated to doing a total of 20 or more of those titles. And in all my titles, in all my books, Remember, they're based on actual events that farmers really do. And when you read them, I ask you, be sure to pass them on from generation to generation. And always think of this. Imagine an era much different than now, when times are not better, but pleasing somehow. Like the year 1950, when farming was done by mothers and fathers and daughters and sons. With tractors and horses we worked on the land, and lacking machinery, we managed by hand. We did tilling and planting and tending the crop. We'd harvest and store it. The work didn't stop. And family members each morning and eve had responsibilities they couldn't leave. This is me at 11 years old carrying milk to the boat tank. And here I'm at four, uh, stacking up some hay with a fork that's much too big for me, as you can see. With pails and pitchforks, we chore twice a day, milking cows, pumping water, feeding silage and hay. We fed mashed for white chickens and corn to red hogs, and milk to the kitties, and scraps to the dogs, and to a team of grand horses with glistening roan coats. We fed mounds of grass hay and two cans like this of clean oats. Remember, you had to be careful not to feed the horses too much oats. Too much oats would make them wild and frisky. And that's where the saying, feeling your oats, comes from. <laughs> Here's another uh, picture of horses 
my dad and myself when we sold the horses in 1954, Daisy and Bill. Dad said they were a far better team than we deserved with our measly 65 acres tillable. I've written some tales in narrative rhyme showing my family spending their time doing things to gather for work or for fun, but always aiming to make every day a good one. That's a picture of my father who always liked to goof around and have fun. No matter how miserable the job was, he would always try to make it fun and make us kids smile. There he is taking that cow's stinky tail and using it for a mustache. Each farm country tale is my humble attempt to characterize a specific event. And to satisfy readers' desires for pleasure, I've mixed fact and fancy, measure for measure. The fact here is this is my mother and my father milking cows on the farm I grew up on. And here's an illustration from one of my stories of the mother in that story milking cows in the year 1950. And in these stories, my family consists of my father and mother. I have a little sister and little brother. Joey's five, Maggie's nine, and I'm Jimmy in the story, a boy of ten. And with a farm country tale, I'll glad to begin. The story today is a farm country picnic. And I want to tell you that uh, we used the name Watkins on that truck there, Watkins truck. You all remember the Watkins man? Because he's in the story and he does a very good deed. And I wrote to the president of Watkins and asked him if we could use the local because it's based on a true thing the Watkins got to get. So he wrote back and gave me permission. Otherwise, you will find no name brands on any tractors in the stories because I don't want to get sued. We do, however, <coughs> use the colors appropriately and people can identify them from there. A farm country picnic. Now, it takes place on that small family farm in 1950 where they're putting up hay with a hay loader. If you remember those fabulous machines. I remember when I first saw how that hay just went right up that rack. I was amazed. I was about four years old and we bought a brand new one. And in the story you have the father and the oldest boy forking the hay and you have the two little kids tramping the hay. Do you remember that, John? Tramping the hay? Because you needed a good, firm load. So it didn't bounce off on the way back to the barnyard. Now, one's five and the other's nine. So how much good are they really tramping the hay? They weigh about 125 between them. Not much good at all. But the point here I'm trying to make is what else would you do with them, right? You can't leave them back in the house. No, no. You take them with. And that's why, as Bob, I was talking to you earlier, that's how kids started working on farms so early, so young. Not because their parents were mean and said, go do that, but because they hung around their parents all the time when they worked. They, that was the only place for them, and they tried to mimic them. That's how you get started milking cows at six years old and doing things like this at five. Now, they're doing this day after day in July. It's hot. It's sticky. Is this what the kids want to be doing? A big no. Very good. This is what they want to be doing. They want to go to the nearby lake, take off their shoes and socks, get a stick and a hook and a line and a sinker and try and catch some bullheads or sunfish or something. That's what they want to be doing. They tell their parents, this map is in the book. Here's the Carlson farm. They say, Mom and Dad, take us down to Webb Lake. We can fish. We can swim. We can have a picnic. We've got a good time. We've got enough to say. Well, how do you think that goes over? The farmer, the father tells them, look here. We have to put a pay when the sun shines. And that's the basic conflict that begins the story of farm country picnic. <clears throat> July 1950 was sunny and warm, and day after day we hauled hay on the farm. Well, my mom drove the tractor, my dad and I stacked, and Joey and Mags tramped the hay, so it packed. For weeks we continued this grueling routine. Relentlessly working till tempers grew mean. One day while unloading, I heard Maggie say, We need a vacation from putting up hay. Let's go on a picnic. Let's go to wet lake. We can fish. We can swim. We deserve a day's break. <laughs> With a frown, Dad replied, I don't mean to be cruel, but make hay when the sun shines is farming's old rule. We're lucky to have such a good second crop. While it's dry and we're able, we must work nonstop. And complaining about it won't answer your wish. But if morning brings rain at Webb Lake, we will fish. 
That night, we wished hard for the rain to bring fun, and our parents continued to hope for more sun. Then early next morning, we heard a cough. Boom! This thunder exploded and rattled our room. The rainwater pounded the house with a roar. It blew through the window and over the floor. I hopped out of bed and I pulled on my clothes and I hurried to see if the windows were closed. Maggie and Joy exclaimed, let's go fish. This storm with its downpour has granted our wish. Our folks are done milking, so let's set the table and get ready for breakfast as fast as we're able. Both Maggie and Joey were fully awake and together they hollered, we're off to Wet Lake. When breakfast was finished, we knew what to do. We tackled our tasks like a farmer's trained crew. Mom scrubbed up the strainer, the milk cans and pails, and stacked the clean items to dry on the rails. Dad hauled the manure from the barn right away. He watered the bull and then fed him some hay. Joey and Mags fed the hogs and the hens, while well, I carried water to all of the pens. When finished with milking, when finished we met by the chicken coop wall, where fishing poles hung since we used them last fall. The lines, Mom exclaimed, are a tangled up bunch. Untangle them, boys, while I pack a big lunch. Then Dad left with Maggie to dig up some bait near the stack of manure by the cow yard's back gate. But before they could get any worms in the cans, the wagon struck came, interrupting our plan. It flew through the yard like a dynamite blast. We couldn't believe it could travel that fast. With his head out the window, Frank gave a loud shout, Hurry up, Carlson's, your cows are all out. They're in Brummer's best corn, but they haven't gone far. Just hop in the car and we'll go where they are. Our shoulders sagged low, for we knew what this meant. Picnic means not how the day would be spent. Instead, we were facing the difficult battle of trying to round up our 70 cattle. We drove to the fence line just west of the slough where the fence was demolished when cattle ran through. Then Dad had a plan and explained what to do. He said, Mary, wait here and keep Joey with you. As we round up the critters and chase them your way, you keep all the cattle from running astray. When cows run toward you, try holding your ground, and to get their attention, just make a loud sound. If a cow doesn't turn, just move out of, your, out of her way. Your safety is important to me every day. We turned at the cross and stopped in the field. We jumped up and hollered to make the cows yield. Well, Frank and my father kept cattle at bay. Both Mags and I hurried to round up a stray. We ran at full speed. Our lungs started to ache. No time was allowed for a breath of a break, for we never would stop till we had all the critters, because Dad would have teased us by calling us quitters. Reluctantly, cattle ran home to the east, except for Joanne, who behaved like a beast. She charged at poor Joey. But Mom had things planned. They shouted together as Mom grabbed Joe's hand. he ah! They both yelled, and the animal froze. When Joanne ran for a home, the chase came to a close. Much later, we locked all the cattle away, and we figured the picnic was <coughs> off for the day. We drove to the pasture to fix the down fence, and seeing the damage again made us wince. This job, Dad explained, we cannot finish soon because fixing the fence will take all afternoon. <laughs> Without wasting a moment or trying to shirk, we started the loading to help it to work. We carried the post and some staples and pails, a shovel, a digger, a bucket of nails, pinchers, two hammers, and several pliers, but only Dad handled the rolls of barbed wires. Although our two parents accomplished the most, I pulled old staples from broken fence posts, and Joey and Mags helped by carrying pails where I could deposit old staples and nails. For the post, Dad dug holes at a really fast rate, and Mom packed the dirt so the post would stand straight. Later, we stopped for a drink of cool water, and Mom said, I'm so proud of my sons and my daughter. You've worked hard for hours without any fuss. Your father and I are so pleased you helped us, so we'll give you a break just to show you our thanks. Go hunt for wild berries along the road banks. Gee, thanks, Mom and Dad, we all hollered with glee. Let's race, Maggie yelled, to the wild cherry tree. As we raced at full speed to the top of the hill, Joe tripped on a stick and he took a bad spill. He scared a small snake when he hit the hard ground. Then a rustling of bushes 
made us turn around as a jackrabbit bounded from out of the brush, we watched as he zigzagged away in a rush. Joe turned his attention to chasing the snake as Maggie proclaimed, this sure beats old web leg. <laughs> we crossed the barbed wire and began picking berries. I decided to climb up a tree of wild cherries. The branches were thin and I heard a loud snap. As I fell to the ground, I could hear Maggie clap. We left with our caps overflowing with berries. Then as Maggie poked fun at my fall picking cherry, she carelessly tripped on a nest of small bees and was stung in her legs as she fell to her knee. We returned to explain to her mom and our dad what fun and excitement the three of us had. I'm glad, Mom said briefly, but now for a treat. It's time for a picnic. Get ready to eat. We had lettuce, fried chicken, dill pickles, potatoes, beets pickled and onions, dark bread and tomatoes. And the chocolate cake was especially dandy because it was topped with divinity candy. Mama rose from her seat and she stood straight and tall. I have something important to say to you all. Children, I hope that you do understand that we make our whole living by farming this land. Pull it together, we'll make the load lighter. Hard work becomes fun and our futures look brighter. Both Dad and I know of your summer's big wish. And we're sorry we failed in our plans to go fish. But we worked hard together, and now that it's done, I hope you can say that today you had fun. You bet, Maggie Howard. Today was the best. Joe tripped on a stick, and I stepped on a nest. A rabbit surprised that you fell from a tree. Joe chased a small snake. I got stung by a bee. The berries were great, and the picnic was grand, and I ate so much chicken, I barely can stand. But chasing the cattle and learning to fence were especially fun, and it made perfect sense to pitching together to make things go slick. Today's been a marvelous farmer's picnic. And that's the end of the story. I hope you liked it. <laughs> then, you know, uh, uh, it's always fun to uh, do things to an audience that uh, recollects a lot of this. I'd say it's like preaching to the choir. In all of my stories, you're going to see things like the family working together in good times and in bad times. I like to show things that you don't see a lot. If anybody remembers stacking cans up on a rail? Also, if you notice, when the, when the mud, because you had to have them upside down, because otherwise they would rust, the dampness would get in. You had to have them upside down like that. Also, you notice the mother was, was tamping the post with the handle of the shovel. That's how we always did it. In fact, the handle would wear almost sharp uh, because you'd be rubbing against that post. So I try to show things like that using the Omen Earth Spreader to haul the fencing equipment. That was pretty well standard. I dedicate this to my to all uh, haymakers, past and present, of course. There's my family. There's me, my dad, my mother, and my 10-year-old nephew is helping us out there driving the tractor. And uh, I dedicate my stories, especially to my parents and my two older sisters, who made my life growing up on the farm a wonderful experience. My sisters were so good, they would read to me regularly. So I always tell children, if somebody reads to you now, be sure and thank them. And when you get old enough to read to somebody, be sure and do it, because they will always love you for it, as I do my sisters. I'd like to thank Zach and all the club members for bringing me here. We have free stickers for anyone who wants them after the show. We'll open it up for questions. As you're thinking about questions, what I like to do is I like to go through the stories and point out the, the detail, the realistic detail that I've tried to capture in these. Uh, you can take time to look at the books as well. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll start out with this book first, and then I'll open it to questions as I go on. In the Farm Country Halloween, my goal is to show trick-or-treating as it was back then. We knocked on the door, yelled trick-or-treat, they'd let you in, pretending they were scared, then they'd say, well, before you give you a treat, you have to take off your mask and say who you are. So you'd take off the mask, then you'd have like a five or nine minute conversation with your adult neighbors. It was such a great social way to touch base once a year for sure with your neighbors. Uh, I enjoyed trick-or-treating so much in that area. And you had to walk, you had to walk down that narrow country road. <laughs> you know, 
bushes on either side, ghosts and goblins laying in the weeds for you. Oh, that was so much fun. Scary, but fun. Any questions or remarks, raise your hand as I go here. If you think of anything at all. In the Thanksgiving book, what I'm trying to do is show an old-fashioned Thanksgiving where the important thing was, well, there were three things particularly that used to be important about Thanksgiving before they invented television and now they blast us with football and parades. You know, what used to be important was get everybody around the table at one time, give thanks, and have a great meal. It was about visiting. It was about that family effort. Notice that's what they do here. They don't have the best dining room set up, you know, backless chairs and benches. But the important thing was two kinds of pies, pumpkin and apple. There is a uh, recipe for pumpkin pie from scratch in the back of this book. I try and show them do all the chores, the important chores to do store, uh, before that big noon meal. How often do you see a book where you, you, you show them taking out the manure or throwing down silage? The kids went sledding. As I remember Thanksgiving, we usually had snow. And we used to do something that we called icing the track. Did you ever do that? We'd pump water and carry pails, make a mush, and it would freeze on that hillside. Later that afternoon, you'd go sledding again. And, oh, man, you'd just go so fast, you wouldn't believe it. Of course, when you are pumping the water, you always have one of these. <laughs> always somebody who has to try that thinking they can remove their tongue fast enough. It doesn't work, kids. Don't try this at home. Swinging in the hay barn on the rope was always a great fun to wonder more people didn't get hurt. But in the Christmas story, I just want to point out, you already know what it's about, but there's that point in there where Jimmy says, as I join in the fun with my sister and brother, I shared a warm smile with my father and mother. And it's at this point, Jimmy realizes how much his parents really do love him, and that is what Christmas is about in this story. In this one, this is the newest book, Farm Country Harvest. It's an adult-sized book. You see it there on the table. It's a coffee table book. It has the story of what happens on the family farm when the threshing machine arrives in 1950. But because you can only tell one story of threshing and one day and one farm and there's so many threshing stories to tell and so many different kinds of threshing. What I did with this one, I had the story illustrated in oil by a fellow by the name of Bob Williams, who uh, excellent artist, you can Google him and see more of his stuff. Horses and Tractors in 1950, that's how I remember it. But because they're so limited on just one story, what I did is I did a part two that shows photographs of past harvest. Back in the 1800s, you know, here you've got a conveyor stacker instead of a blower. And, you know, I talk about all these old machines and I explain different things about threshing. And uh, in part three of the book, because you can only find so many photographs and you can't find them that tell the whole story, I went to a number of shows, of threshing shows that are in current celebrations, and I found things like, like this that I can talk about. If you've ever seen a treadmill, a horse on a treadmill running a threshing machine, you know, that's the kind of thing you're not going to find an old photograph of. So, so these, that's why I did a part three on this book that shows these, uh, these uh, old cell, or these current celebrations. So that's this series. And in this series, very quickly, Nancy's adventure, Nancy wants to be a dairy farmer. She tells her kitty Dusty all about it. First thing she does is goes out and calls the cows the proper way. Kambas, kambas. I have seen children's books that will call cows, here cow, here cow. That's not right. <laughs> it's kambas, kambas. She finds a cow out there uh, with a calf. She goes out to get that calf, and she finds her neighbor's treat by a bull. I put that in there because when I grew up, there was always there were always bulls in the pasture. And you know, my dad would say when I was nine, he'd say, "Go out and get the cow for you, but watch out for that bull." 
well, how do you watch out for a bull? Well, you do what they did. You make sure there's a tree nearby. <laughs> and I put that in a kid's story because I want to make sure they realize that farming is not now and never was a petting zoo, like a lot of places like it turned it into. You know, you just didn't go around and have fun petting everything. It was danger, hard work. That's what I like to show in this. She does the same thing. She squirts the kitty. She teaches a newborn calf how to drink out of a pail. Little Tommy has an exciting adventure. He wants to go fencing, and he dresses up like a farmer, including having the uh, pliers in the pocket like everybody carried when I was. This is actually my dad's last pliers he had before he passed away. I carry it with me now for good luck. It's been good to me so far. He goes fencing, and he goes to the back pasture. There's a glossary in the back of this book, too. And what he finds is there's somebody stuck in an old road on the other side of the pasture. This used to happen all the time in the spring because the roads were so bad there'd always be some city slicker who took a wrong turn and you'd spend half a day pulling him out with your team of horses and little tractor. And that's what he does. And they're out of gas and when he comes back with some gas he finds some robbers back there and he chases them down with his tractor. He's got a pretty vivid imagination. In field work, both of them are in it. He wants to do his field work the old way, she does it the modern way. This is a very good history lesson, folks, because every page you see, they're doing a different piece of work explaining what they're doing to their pet, and all of that's accurate. Notice he's using the old farm or the old horse drawn drill with the pole saw. This is the kind we had at home. In fact, my father always told me, he said, Son, the only reason your mother and I had you was so there'd be somebody back here to pull those levers. <laughs> I, uh, I used to think he was kidding, but I was never quite sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy cuts it with the gray binder. He has to shock it. The kids always notice that Tommy is sweating. See that? Hard work. Well, of course, Nancy's up here in the air-conditioned combine talking to her kitty. Uh, Nancy uh, in the combine, Tommy has to thresh, and then they go plowing in adjacent fields, and Tommy thinks he can make one more round before he pulls out for that wet spot. What do you suppose happens to him? <laughs> yeah, he gets stuck. And of course, Nancy helps him out. You see, she's on her way there too. So, help out your neighbor is always a big theme in all of my stories. I have one here to tell you about. This is illustrated by a 12-year-old boy. The premise is that a child, uh, children come back from a field trip to the farm, and the principal asks them, what do you see in the farm, kids? And they tell the principal a tall tale. <laughs> On every page, it shows you what they saw, but this is what they tell the principal. I'll read one to you here. This is what the little boy saw. This is what he tells the principal. What I saw in the farm caused me great alarm. Instead of the horse pulling hard in the heat, she sat on a tractor up high in the seat. And she steered the front wheels with the hooves on her feet. Her legs were so long that it was a tight squeeze as she struggled to fit in her kneesy knees knees. So that's my kind of my attempt at a Dr. Seuss where I get to make up some words and stuff. Folks, I hope you're interested in my books as saving farm heritage, farm pride, and as... Uh, Farm literacy for young children as well. Free stickers for kids and anybody else who wants them. Take a look at books. I'll hang around here as long as anybody wants to talk to me. And if there are questions or smart remarks right now, <laughs> is the time. Yes. Tell us about Sundays. On Sundays? Yeah. Was well, it a different day? It was a different day, although if there was uh, hay to put up, we put it up. If uh, if there was a reason, if the cows got out, you know, anything at all, uh, frankly, I always thought there was kind of a kind of a search for an excuse to skip church, but I, I don't, I'm not sure about that, but it, it seemed to me. The church was a long ways away from my house, too. So for us to make 9 o'clock, we had a hustle chores, really, a lot. Um, but in the uh, afternoon, would be a ball game in the summertime, and in the wintertime we'd have company who'd come over and we'd play euchre. And uh, sometimes my my uh, neighbor friends would come over, 
And we would play, if there was another company in the house, the house was small, we'd play euchre in the barn on the straw bales. In fact, I wrote a poem on that, and that book of poetry will be coming out uh, next uh, spring. <coughs> Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Um, I like the, um, the coffee cat and the, what was the other one, the oats? Like oh, yeah. Uh, Patrick Oats. Or feeling, feeling your oats. Feeling your oats. Feeling your oats. I wonder if you ever, if you collect those, or you ever thought about making a book with those? Because I always, I too always think of the ones like lathered up, or you're lathered up, yes. or chomping at the bit, or yeah. how many of those actually came, you know, I just think it'd be yeah. neat to kind of, um, people know, people say those, but I don't even think they know, they actually think back to them. And a lot of times they get them wrong. Uh, dog eat dog work. You've heard that, right? Dog eat dog work. Meaning that it's, cutthroat, you know, survival of the fittest, whatever you want to say. But how often, you know, I used to be an English teacher and I taught writing. How often I've seen that written as doggy dog. A doggy dog world. <laughs> well, that person writing that had just heard it and they didn't have a clue what they were saying. But yeah, I have thought of it. But, you know, now the internet, you can go there and Google just about anything and it'll tell you. Although yeah, sometimes they get it wrong. But I thought just have the story with the picture or something like that and kind of because people do say it and don't even know. I mean they say it know what it means, but they just know that out of habit and don't even think that with the photographs. That is, yeah. a, that is a good idea, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I gotta tell you this, I learned this just the other day, uh, from a fellow whose heritage of threshing well he's actually in my book, his name is Ron Lund. Goes back to um, uh, the eighteen hundreds when his grandfather uh, custom combine or custom uh, thresh. Um, people often talk about using snow fence for corn cribbing, you know, and we've all seen that, right? He said, no, he said, that was corn cribbing, and they used it for snow fence. <laughs> now that's something I didn't know. It was actually invented and manufactured for corn cribs. And <laughs> the, uh, the uh, road people used it for their purposes. So they just, I thought that they was just put it in a circle and then threw yeah, the point and yeah. it up there and threw it Or put in them. big corner posts because, you know, they could double deck it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that is what it was manufactured for. I did not know that. Is your farm still around? I live in a little five acre piece of it uh, with a pole shed and six tractors that I uh, collect. You know, my, my folks had one and they ran the farm. I had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of tractors do you collect? Uh, Ford, because that's what I grew up with. But, you know, I work for neighbors, so I've driven pretty much every color tractor you can imagine. Yes? Did you have any adventures going snipe hunting back in the day? or? <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I didn't uh, snipe hunt if, if you're referring to that joke. Okay. Yeah. I, I know. But I know that uh, that was pulled on people. Yeah, my. And it was done at night. And uh, in the guise of uh, usually during coon hunting, during coon hunting, some neighbors had coon dogs too. Yep. How about a polka on dancing the polka on Saturday night? <laughs> you know, uh, here's uh, and, and you know you bring up these things, and uh, this is why I'm writing that series with all these stories because what we do with these stories is you do farm activities and then there's a special event like I do have one planned with a wedding so you're going to see that kind of wedding um, thing and how the wedding lasted all day long depending upon well my mother uh, grew up Catholic so all her relatives it was a Catholic wedding and, and my father was Scandinavian so that was a Lutheran wedding so it depended on what side of the family what kind of wedding it's going to be. But, yeah, very definitely that's going to show up. Uh, although it wouldn't be a whole book, it would be part of it. Well, thank you for those questions. Any others? Great. Would you do me a favor right now? Yeah. Uh, my wife works so hard. And, you know, the applause, I know, is always looking at me. But would you give her a nice big hand? Thank you. Thank you so much.